government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. Mm -hmm. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. Hey, where's the love for one another? Government doesn't love us. That's what we need. We need to get back to a system where people can take care of one another. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was illegal? I bet nobody would put the hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Logan for Liberty. I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest where the sun shines so bright just to rain a few hours later. Why do I keep saying that? I have no idea because chances are most of my listeners, if I have any listeners, aren't from the Pacific Northwest, but that is where I'm from. That is where I reside. Therefore, that is the intro that I am sticking with. I was going through my head of all the different things that this particular podcast was going to be about. I was going to go through the news, read a bunch of articles, figure out what I wanted to talk about. Um, I just got done recording a video that I will be uploading probably tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. I'm recording this specific podcast on the 14th. This podcast will be on the 14th. So, the video I recorded will be up on the 16th. It will be about education and psychology. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of um, what this video is going to be about, I was reading up on some psychology. I like to read. My reading tastes are eclectic. So, I'm an eclectic reader. So, there, there's many things that interest me. I also have a short attention span, so I oftentimes will shift between th two to five different books. Uh, I think I mentioned this in my last podcast. Um, I'm currently reading Atlas Shrugged based, uh, by Ayn Rand, Common Sense Economics by L. Albert Hahn. I started The School Revolution by Ron Paul. I'm reading The Science of Human Nature, a Psychology for Beginners by William Henry Pyle. I'm reading Philosophy 101 by Paul Kleinman. Um, I have another book somewhere that I think I was reading. No, no, that, that about sums it up right now. I mentioned it in my last podcast. Um, the per uh, somebody commented on my last podcast asking if, or saying that they wish I would have showed titles because this is just an audio podcast. So I will put up the covers to the titles in this podcast for that commenter if that person ends up watching this video again. So let me get on with my point. I'm an eclectic reader and I wanted to read about psychology and I was inspired to read about psychology due to uh, discovering over the last couple of years Jordan Peterson and God Saad. Both ev well, God Saad's an evolutionary psychologist and Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist. And a psychoanalyst, and obviously with psychologists, there's some crossover. You might, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know. But from what I've seen, there's so many different subdivisions of psychology, and sometimes you know you might master in one, or you might you know really study one particular type of psychology, but you might cross over into the other branches and kind of integrate it into what you know about psychology. A, kind of like a doctor, a good surgeon, a good neurosurgeon might know a little something about the rest of human anatomy and other illnesses that are available. It's just the nature of it. Um, so I keep getting distracted. It's my short attention span. <clears throat> I was reading this book and there was a specific part where they were talking about a particular subdivision of psychology known as educational psychology. And what I read was downright scary. And it wasn't scary in the sense like, oh, I think the world is taking us over. I think the the world government, the new world order is brainwashing our children. Nothing like that. But what it did was 
it woke me up and made me realize that part of our education system, part of any education system, and part of a well-established education system whose priority it is to make sure that they can instill the most amount of wisdom on your children is understanding psychology, of course. That, that's what they need to do. They need to know how to influence your kids. They need to know what tricks to get your kids interested into what they're teaching. And they need a, a way to reach your kids. And that's no matter... That is... It doesn't matter what system, who it's run by, that is an aspect of education. So I'm not scared of what I read in this book for the reasons of conspiracy. But what made it scary to me was that we have a Department of Education, which I believe came about uh, in the 70s due to Richard Nixon. I would have to double check, but it, it was a Republican that started, a, a Republican president that signed into law the Department of Education. I'm assuming Democrats were also for it too around this time. And George W. Bush really increased the power and scope of the Department of Education. So we have this centralized force, this centralized organization, which, if we want to make a constitutional argument, which is the, supposed to be the law of the land, the Constitution does not give the federal government authority to found, to, to start up the Department of Education. The Department of Education is not in the Constitution. The federal government has no authority whatsoever over education. And yet, here they are. So there's the constitutional argument of that. But what I'm more concerned about than just the constitutional argument is, okay, let's say that the Department of Education was in the Constitution and that the, the founding fathers during the Constitutional Convention, when, you know, they basically threw out the Articles of Confederation, even, even if there is a uniform agreement that, all right, we can let the federal government control education. And so James Madison wrote it down, and there we go, in the United States Constitution. We have the Department of Education in the Constitution. I would still be skeptical of it. I would still be uncomfortable with it for many reasons. This is a central... Let me, let me get on with the, uh, the implications that I'm trying to hint at. You have this centralized force in control of your education. This central body. I can't remember the exact numbers of congressmen, but it's like 600 something. Am I right? Something along the lines. And then you have a hundred senators. And then you have one president who is elected by the Electoral College of the States. And then you have, I think, eight or nine judges on the bench to determine whether this is constitutional. That's all you have. You have 600, 700, 800 people, ballpark estimate. I don't know the exact numbers, and this is disappointing. I just, I ruined any credibility I had for a political, po for, you know, podcasts where I talk about politics. But, that's all you have. And they get to decide your children's education. They get to be in control of this Department of Education that sets the curriculum, that hires psychologists to figure out how to influence your children. And in some aspect, even manipulate your children. And manipulation, it's unavoidable. But here's why it's scary coming from the most centralized force organization, not only in the country, but in the world. It's a small amount of people speaking on behalf, if not for, over 300 million people, and yes, I'm including children, because children are affected by politics too. I'm not making an argument for children to vote, FYI. But, think about this. You're... You are from San Francisco, California. And the school that is as far west is the school that is farthest west in California as possible. 
is partially being controlled not only by a senator from Alabama. Let's do Georgia. Let's go even farther east. But also a congressman from Alabama, if not Georgia. They get to decide what your child in California, so far west from them, they get to control what they learn. Not only, I'm, I'm speaking as an Oregonian, in, my, in the state that I live in of Oregon, there is a cultural divide between people that live in the, the Pacific Northwest part of Oregon versus the people that live in the South part of Oregon, the southwest part of Oregon, versus everybody else who lives in the eastern part of Oregon. The eastern part of Oregon is a desert. It's dry. The farther south you go and the farther, the closer you get to California, the warmer it is. This is just environment and climate that I'm talking about. The town I live in, we're surrounded by hills. We have to go through or over a hill to get to the next town. Sorry, that's my phone going off real quick. Um, phone call. That's that's something that I want you to think about. Just in my state of Oregon. Uh, yeah, uh, 435 in the House of Representatives. I just got a clarification. Um... Uh. Let me try to get my train of thought back. I know what I was talking about. So we have these four quadrants of Oregon that couldn't be more different than from each other than they are. We basically have three to four different countries in the state of Oregon. We have our rainy rainforest right next to the beach. We have our urban desert to the east. Not urban desert, our rural desert to the east. And then towards our south... It's a almost a perfect mix between the desert and some California beach type weather. Almost tropical in a sense. But it's not tropical. Obviously living in these separate areas are going to give you a different view of life. The requirements to stay comfortable are going to be different. So not only is your relationship with the environment in the climate significantly different these are also populations that differ in central west oregon we have our big cities central oregon we have even more big cities western oregon it's kind of a mix we have some mid-sized to small towns along the coast eastern oregon yeah no that's as uh that's as rural as it gets so there's also a rural and urban divide in my state. We don't even like it when Portland, Oregon controls the rest of the state. Because the, the, most of the people live there. Because their life is so different from ours. So imagine somebody in rural Georgia making a decision about your child's education in San Francisco, California. And I'm appealing to, to the left on this particular case. Because elitist coastal town people and big city people generally think of rural people as uneducated so why would you want an uneducated individual to have a voting right or to have the ability to vote on somebody who is going to affect affect your education which will have your child's education which will have monstrous effects and of course this is the problem with centralized government so let me appeal to the more conservative rural type. Imagine, for example, that you do live, and I can, I've lived in both a city and a rural town, so I know what this is like within the same state. So I can only imagine that it gets a little bigger uh, when you go nationwide. Imagine you live in rural Georgia, rural Alabama, even rural Florida. And some dingwit from Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, San Francisco, California, Los Angeles, California, San Diego, California, Eugene, Oregon, Olympia, any any town that's you know bigger than most small towns in rural Georgia, 
where The Walking Dead takes place, right? Imagine these coastal elites get to decide what your child's education is. What are they going to teach your child? Nothing useful. Their priorities are different than yours. This is the problem with a centralized government that is so massive. Just, and the reason why I brought up my state of Oregon is because Oregon is a relatively, it's not a small state in area size. It's no Texas, like the 13th biggest state, I think, or the 14th or 15th, I think. The population's like 3 million people, I think, something around there. This, no 300 million people, that's for sure. Nothing compared to California. Nothing compared to New York State. Nothing compared to Texas. And we have a huge problem between a rural and urban divide. A huge fraction of the voters live in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon has enough votes between them to where even if every other county voted against them, it would still be a close race. And this is something that sort of uh, people who are in favor of the Electoral College make an argument about, you know, look at all these city centers voting on behalf of everybody else. And then one of the counter arguments to that from people who don't support the Electoral College, believe me, this has a point, I'm not just going off on a tangent. One of their rebuttals is, well, it's not our fault that people live in one area. Or it's not our fault that you know, certain states or certain cities or certain counties have a bigger population or that most people live in these areas, they miss the fundamental point. I think the points the points I'm about to say are intrinsic. They're obvious. They exist regardless of whether or not you think they do. If you live in a city, if you live in an apartment high-rise, your life is vastly different than if you own a house in the hills where there's nobody else in the middle of the forest out in the middle of an open rural field that's just the fact that that is I can tell you right now I didn't live in an apartment high-rise I was born in Portland Oregon I lived I did live in an apartment on a road where you could probably walk five minutes to a highway in either direction lived right across from the fire department next to a busy street it might have, the street might have been a highway. I can't remember. Buses going through. The the max wasn't too far away. Um, you had almost any rest, fast food restaurant and corner store you could think of within a, a 10 minute walk radius. Some schools and bike riding distance. It was a big area. My grandma lived in a high rise well, high-rise for Portland, <laughs> lived in a high-rise apartment in the same city. I moved to rural Oregon. I'm not going to say where. Most buildings out here, the only building that has more than two stories, I think, is the hospital. Maybe there's one apartment building that has three or four stories. That's the highest four-story buildings in this town. And there's only, you can count on both hands of how many buildings go over four stories in this town. You know, if you go to a city in Portland, a lot of the neighborhoods are tightly built together. The backyards aren't huge. They're big enough, you know, where you can have barbecues. Out here in rural Oregon, you could play two-hand touch football in your backyard. Or if your neighborhood is tightly built, there's a field right across from the street. And it's a five-minute walk. Or you can take a ten-minute walk to go to the school. One of the many schools that have an open field. Those are your options. Life is very different, is what I'm trying to say. And life is different due to climate, due to geography, due to uh, population density. Culture is different for many reasons. And yet we're trying to say that all these people are unified. And that the centralized government can represent everybody. It's impossible for a centralized government to represent everybody. Maybe students in California 
should be focused on how to work in Silicon Valley. Maybe that should be their priority. Maybe people in Georgia should learn how to farm or agri do agriculture or, you know, industrial mechanics. Each state, my point is, is that each state has their general, what, like their main source of revenue. Maybe the education should be, for the most part, based around that. You still get your general education, so if you want to go to college, you can. But no, every single form of education is almost 100% the same across the 50 different states, with slight variations in maybe uh, school year lengths and the lengths of the day. Other than that, the curriculum, it's basically the same. Where I live, maybe we should... You know, your your main source of, or your main thing of education, maybe should be within your four years of high school, you're going to learn forestry, because we have a big logging community out here, maybe some agriculture, and you could even put those in the same if you want to say that vegetation or biology is both related to agriculture and forestry. Um, technical skills for working at one of the lumber mills out here. That could be a full year of education. So, you know, teaching kids how to be millwrights and stuff like that. And then maybe partly technical because we have silicone forest in Portland and the Eugene area. And though that could work because you could you still teach math, you teach biology. Learning those two, three, four, five different industries. So you're still getting your general education, and kids who graduate high school within your state, they have a general education to where they can move on and go to college, or maybe go apply for a job somewhere else, or they can go right into the workforce in your state. That's an idea. But those options, the more a centralized government has control over that particular subsect of of life or education the less control that each state has the less control that the county has the less control that the city or town has the less control that the family has the less control that the child has over their own education my whole point bringing up the states though I realized I kind of got off topic was that centralized government is bad enough as far as the United States as a whole goes but state centralized governments are bad enough already, as well. And that was my point. And even in the county I live in, we have... The way our county is shaped, it's longer. So it's not really east and west county. That's not a significant enough difference. It's north county, mid county, and south county. North and south county are more rural than mid county. Mid county is still rural. South County is more farming and stuff like that, so some more, uh, you know, South County sounds like how it should be, you know, Southerners. North County, it's a beach, the beach part of the county. The school for North County, the high school for North County is right on the beach, almost. Two minute walk from the school to the beach. You just cross the train tracks, go down, smoke some pot on the beach, go back to class. That's what happens. Mid-county, eh, you're not, I mean, you're a 15-minute drive away from the beach in either direction, north or south. Mid-county is kind of a mix between south county and north county. It's rural enough, there's farms, obviously. The farther south you go, the more farms there are. The bigger businesses are in mid-county because not only is mid-county the mid, middle of the county... It's this one stretch of highway that goes through the county that connects south, north, and mid-county. And the bigger population lives in mid-county, so most of the big businesses are in mid-county. Okay. Fair enough. The bigger high school is in mid-county. We have three high schools in our county. And it is a mix because probably the, the five highest paying jobs in the county... The biggest paying one is a union job. It's unions. 
So naturally, people who work in unions tend to be more left-leaning because, historically, the Democrat Party has been the party of unions. So people who support the union or who are favorable f towards the union are going to work at this specific place for the sake of joining a union. So that's just an example of the county that I live in being way too centralized because this mid-county controls most of the politics of North and South County and there's a divide between North, South, and mid-county. That is significant enough to where they really should have no influence over each other. It's not uncommon for the county council to overlook South and North County. Like, the population of mid-county is like 45,000 people. The population of North and South County sometimes barely reaches a thousand per town or city. And just to put it in perspective, from Mid County, it probably takes 30 minutes to 45 minutes to leave the county going north or south. Driving. So, I mean, it's kind of a big county, but due to the, geograph the geography of the county the population's kind of spread apart. And it's just one highway that connects the entire county in reality. You have some smaller back roads. Only the locals tend to use them to avoid the tourists coming through. Basically, my point is to start wrapping this up because we're reaching the half hour mark. Centralization Shouldn't it be your go-to answer? Specifically for education, we should definitely look to decentralization and free market solutions to, you know, the, the prospects of, of raising your kids. There's so many great online alternatives that teach your kids the basics. I think there's a plethora of different ways to teach your kids the things that you want them to learn. Education maybe should be based more locally with some general education to help your kid branch out if they want to. All I know is, is that the argument between centralization and decentralization is so important for us to have. We shouldn't force people who are so different from each other to be the same. And that's essentially what centralized politics does. I mean, that's what politics does in general, no matter the scale. But, the bigger the scale, the worse it is. I mean, in reality, the United States is like 50 different countries, and each individual 50 countries still has their, you know, several different subdivisions of people. The denizens of each state are unique from each other. Whether you travel north, south, east, or west in a state, and as I stated, counties. And this argument or, or conversation about centralization and decentralization and what's preferable for politics goes beyond education. I think for the most part, the founding, if, if you were to try to set up a government to the best of your abilities, the founding fathers, I think, came as close as ever before in creating a government that is so limited that it was almost impossible for it to become tyrannical. They came as close as humanly possible, in my opinion. If anybody can point to an example of a country that is that was smaller than the United States, government-wise, please point me to it. I know there were certain countries that had different ideas about how to limit the government, but the most effective was the United States. And it still didn't work. Or maybe it did work. I don't know. Maybe all this argument and division we're having, you know, is... Is proof of that. The, uh, gridlock. The political gridlock that we see. Except for when they agree, when politicians agree, it's typically the bad stuff they agree on. Again, this is from my opinion. I don't know what it's like to live in Georgia. I don't know what it's like to live in Florida. I don't know what it's like to live in New York State. I don't know what it's like to live in New Jersey. 
I have no idea what it's like to live in Vermont. I don't know what it's like to live in Texas. I, me, in Oregon, I should have no right to dictate or to have the ability to vote somebody in charge who is capable of making decisions on your behalf. That's for sure. Now I'm just ranting on. Um, so do look for my video about education and psychology tomorrow. It's not going to be too long of a video and it's not going to be too short. It's four, five, six minutes. Um, I hope you all have a fantastic day. And I hope you take away, I hope you take something away from this podcast. Like I said, um, I was going to read some articles and try to formulate a topic, but I just wanted to kind of talk about things, what was on my mind, especially after writing the script for uh, my video about education and psychology. There is some stuff in the news that I could be talking about. I could be talking about Jeffrey Epstein, but... Or Jeffrey Epstein. Or Epstein. I don't know how you pronounce it. But, uh... I don't know. That just feels like jumping on a bandwagon for the sake of views. I think there's a million other things that we can talk about that are far more interesting. Like the things that are affecting our life. I, listen, I, I, I think... I don't know. P pedophiles are bad no matter what. But the dude's dead... It's, it's not that I don't think there's nothing interesting to talk about Jeffrey Epstein or Epstein. It's just that I think we need to... This is a topic for another time. It's just that I think... That we are too narrow-sighted. We have our vision... As a spotlight too narrow... When certain things like this happen to where we only focus on one thing... Instead of every other issue that we have. So I'm trying to shift the conversation to the best of my abilities. Into a conversation that has more of an impact on each and every one of us. Than this sick individual who may or may not have been killed by the Clintons. Maybe I'll talk about that. Have a good one.